uh, we humans would come to think that there was actually something meeting the conception of a divine being. Well, it would seem to me that uh, that the reason it doesn't necessarily what I'm saying is necessarily uh, proof. What it, is, it seems to me is that individuals who have thought about this say, well, no, this is an explanation. Right. And so all they're doing is offering an explanation, not not in fact saying it, it's not a proof. Yes. Well, uh, uh, explanations from evolution. Um, if if they are to actually be established, you know, accepted um, on on rational grounds, it, it need a lot of support. You can you can tell a kind of just so story, which I think that is, and it may be true. I'm not saying it's yeah. not true, but to establish it would take There's a lot of work. Another question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think in a simpler scenario, if you accept the relationship between cause and effect, when you see an effect, you have to postulate a cause. Well, that means that we we have a belief in in a god or or gods, so there must be some cause for it. No, no, we see the effect: a thunderstorm. Oh, I see. A tree I see that. And we that, have to postulate okay, a cause. Right. And if we don't know right. much science then the right. easiest one to postulate is a god. Well then, uh, so that that's sort of like the uh, first of these explanations in terms of the thunder and lightning and so forth. Um, the, the question one would want to ask is uh, uh, why, why would you think that it was a, a god that was causing these things? So that, As a matter of fact, that was Democritus' expl explanation, wasn't it? Yes. They uh, see thunder, thunder and lightning right. and think that it must right. be caused by a god. Right. Yes. And that's why Plato wanted to burn his books. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It seems to me from your quotations that we're talking about a society in which there was at least a fair amount of open skepticism about the existence of gods. Well, uh, people wrote things where there was there was explicit agnosticism in the for in, in Protagoras, which gets quoted in uh, I, I think this quotation is, is in Plato, but at any rate it's quoted later on. And uh, these these uh, explanations of belief in the gods in some cases imply that there are no gods. So that's ex explicit or implicit atheism. Yes, so people did. We suggested that society as a whole is relatively tolerant of those ideas, suggesting that maybe the average person was somewhat skeptical. Quite unlike any other, quite unlike societies in, in, in Europe uh, uh, later on. Yeah, I, I would think it very unlikely that somebody in ancient Egypt would have been writing things like this. I, I think there was a difference in, in the Greek culture. Uh, and in, say, a, a, a culture like that of ancient Egypt or Babylonia, where things were controlled by priests. Um, okay, uh, I, I'm going to, uh, by the way, uh, who's going to stop me at some point? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, because uh, just, just cut me off when this has gone on long enough. I don't have to get to the end, um, so we can go back and forth a bit, uh, and uh, we'll see how far we get. Um, what I have next is uh, the quotations uh, from uh, uh, Plato, um, which uh, illustrate the point the gentleman over here made about uh, the, the uh, introduction of dogmas about the gods and the uh, uh, proposal to enforce these uh, legally. So the first quotation is from Plato's Republic. Um, in the section where there is a discussion of uh, the education of children in this uh, imaginary uh, city that they're thinking of, they're, they're talking about, you know, what would be a just political system, and they're talking about uh, uh, its various features, and particularly the educational system, and there is a critique here of the stories that are told to the children. Uh, in Athens of the time, about the gods, the kind that I mentioned that you find in Homer and Hesiod, uh, and an argument uh, 
that the gods have certain characteristics and a proposal that the poets who make up these stories, and Plato supposes that they're inventions, or Socrates supposes that they're inventions, uh, will conform to uh, these principles. And so I'm just quoting uh, a, a very short bit of a long discussion uh, that gives you the principles that uh, the poets are supposed to conform to. Um, first, that a god isn't the cause of all things, but only of good ones. Uh, so the idea found in uh, uh, some of these uh, poems that Zeus, you know, is pulling out the bad things and visiting them on human beings, that that's not to be allowed to be said. Uh, and secondly, uh, that the gods are not sorcerers who change themselves, and nor do they mislead us by falsehoods in words or deeds. Uh, not sorcerers who change themselves because gods are perfect, and any change is a change for the worse, uh, and not misleading us by falsehoods, not because lying is in general wrong, actually there's a very interesting discussion about lying, um, but because the reasons uh, why lying might be justified, and they're, they're specified in this discussion, don't apply to the gods. So uh, we human beings, on occasion, might be justified in telling lies, uh, but the gods are not. So this, this would be uh, incompatible with um, a purified conception of, of the gods. So this is a kind of critique from a rational perspective of the popular conception of the gods, which implies, I mean, uh, clearly Socrates believes there are gods, he has assumptions about their nature, and he's proposing that what you tell the children about the gods uh, in the stories that they're told have to conform to these principles. And uh, in, in the laws, a very long and boring work written towards the end of Plato's life, um, <clears throat> these uh, three old gentlemen uh, are having uh, this very long-winded conversation about setting up a system of uh, a set of laws. So this is much more specific uh, than the discussion in the Republic. Uh, you know, what's, what's to be the penalty for this kind of homicide, what's to be the penalty for that kind of homicide, for an imaginary new colony. Um, and uh, in this part of the discussion, they're talking about um, the requirement of belief. So religious beliefs are to be legally enforced, and there are penalties, uh, you know, for, for, for not believing these things. Um, there are arguments for... Uh, the dogmas that are going to be enforced, uh, but the proposal, which is, I think, quite alien to the general uh, Greek tradition in which uh, uh, Plato lived, uh, is to enforce them legally. So there are three theses, uh, I think I mentioned them before, that the gods exist, that they are concerned uh, for us, and that they can't be bribed. Uh, they're absolutely above being corrupted into flouting justice. So it, it, this uh, reflects uh, uh, or corresponds to a uh, point made in the Republic um, where uh, one of Plato's brothers, Adamantus, is talking about these wandering priests who are uh, in essence selling indulgences. If you pay them some money, uh, they'll say that uh, some prayers and that means the gods won't punish you for the wicked deeds that you've done in the past so you can get yourself off the punishment by paying them some money. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, Plato was evidently concerned to, uh, his view about the gods, he was evidently concerned uh, to come back. Uh, yes? Uh, just going back a little bit, because I know where you draw the line between Socrates and Plato. Yes. Socrates wasn't killed for religious reasons. If you want to use a modern term, people would consider him a fascist. He didn't support democracy.